Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Henry Tan and I used to be a site supervisor for Mission Viejo High School. Today we're going to be talking about the geopolitics of the Middle East. Now before I start, I should note that this presentation is a little bit more involved than some of the other ones you've had in the past. There's a lot of history, a lot of dates, a lot of times, and what might help you is, first of all, to take notes, and second of all, at the top of your notes to create a timeline, um, starting with around the 1880s, going all the way to maybe the 1960s or 70s. Um, the dates aren't really important in this presentation, but it's really important to get to know what the context of a particular situation is. So throughout the presentation, I might tell you a certain date, and you could just note it on your timeline when this particular event happened, and it might help you understand what was going on at the time. So we'll begin. Let's start with a brief overview of what you'll be covering. First of all, we'll go into the definition of what geopolitics means, because it's important to understand how this relates to the rest of our unit on the Arab Spring and social revolutions. Second of all, we'll talk about the fall of the Ottoman Empire and very briefly about the Ottoman Empire and what it is or what it was. Um, then we'll go into a big chunk about European imperialism, going into mandates, the protectorates, um, the reasons for imperialism, finally to independence and the rise of autocracy in the Middle East. And from there, in your next sections, we'll pick up on what happened after. So first of all, what is geopolitics? Um, in this presentation, we'll try to explore the geopolitical factors that influence the development of the Middle East. And those geopolitical factors include natural resources, uh, borders are another very, very important one, um, even climate and demographics. Demographics meaning the makeup of a particular area in terms of the ethnic groups or the, any other traits of the society. Um, very common examples of geopolitics, or actually one in the news right now would be the current sort of um, ideological struggle over Ukraine. So if, if you're in the news, if, if you're listening to the news right now, um, you would probably know that Russia, the EU, the US have a certain struggle over the territory in Crimea. Um, so that, that whole border dispute or that territorial dispute is an example of geopolitics because they're fighting over a certain region as opposed to, let's just say, um, you know, economic ideology or something else. So why do we talk about geopolitics in the Middle East? So it's important to note that the Middle East has been the crossroads of the world for a very long time. So if you've ever heard of the Silk Road, you would know that it is a network of trade routes going from Europe to Asia um, and even to Africa. And in the middle of that, the hub of all of that trade was the Middle East. So you couldn't get past any of this, you couldn't get past the Middle East if you tried to trade into these areas. Um, and for that reason, it became, um, th there, was, there was a lot of history and culture and trade that flowed through this area, and it really impacted how the culture developed in, in this region. Um, it was also the dominion of several great empires throughout history, and we'll go into one of those empires. So if you've been following uh, contemporary history or just, um, just history in general, you know that the Ottoman Empire was a very, very powerful empire it lasted over 500 years, um, but we won't talk about it in too much detail. All we need to know is that it was centered in the Middle East and North Africa region. And at the height of its power around the 1700s, or the 1600s, um, it was almost as large as the Roman Empire. In fact, it was the Ottomans who finally toppled the Eastern Roman Empire and took it over. So if you remember, um, the, Ro the Roman Empire split into East and West, and in the East, they had uh, the Byzantine Empire, which the center of which was Constantinople. Well, the um, Ottoman Empire eventually invaded that region and took over Constantinople and renamed it Istanbul, which is currently a major city in Turkey at this time. Um, but once it reached the height of its power, it started to decline. And this is for several um, reasons, um, but we won't go into that. But if you can see in the map on your right, you can see that by around 1914, most of the Ottoman Empire had shrunken down to this very small area near um, what's currently modern-day Turkey. Um, the rest of these territories were lost to the European powers. And so for a long time, the Ottoman Empire was actually called the sick man of Europe. So just to give you some background, there were five to six great powers in, during this time period of the 1800s. Um, 1900s. And those powers were Germany, 
uh, Britain, France, the Ottoman Empire, and Austria-Hungary. And so um, the weakest of them ended up being the Ottoman Empire. But a lot of these other powers tried to keep it together artificially so that it wouldn't fall apart and there would be chaos. And the reason for that is if the Ottoman Empire suddenly fell apart, all of the other European powers would start fighting for these territories. Um, and they didn't want that to happen. So if you look at the political cartoon on your left, that's actually from that time period. And you can see that there's a caricature of the Ottomans um, wearing the traditional Fez hat um, sitting there at the top. And then you can see the man in the top hat that represents Britain. The man with the captain's hat represents Russia. And you can see the man next to Russia uh, represents France. And then there's Germany. And they are saying, let us have a peace. Um, in, in parentheses, it actually says peace as in like sort of like a piece of pizza or a piece of candy. Um, so this has a dual meaning. The Europeans are outright saying, let's have a peace, let's not fight, let's you know, try to solve our disputes um, without violence. But what they really mean is let's carve up the Ottoman Empire for when it falls, we'll all have a piece of this nice big pie. Um, so during the 1900s, the European powers were actually deciding how they want to cut up the Ottoman Empire when it eventually falls. So this goes into our next slide about European imperialism. Um, at this time, Britain and France were the big powers in the Middle East. Russia in the early 1900s, if you recall, was actually going through a social revolution. This was in, the, in 1917 was when they actually became the Soviet Union. So there was a communist revolution in Russia, so they couldn't really take part in this um, sort of backroom dealing and how to cut up the Middle East. And a really big, important agreement was the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916. And this is one period that you should mark down in your timeline. So if you recall, I told you it would be very helpful to write a timeline starting from 1880s going to like around 1960s. And so in the middle of that, you could put, the ni or you could put 1916. Um, so in the middle of World War II, which lasted from 1914 to 1918, just directly in the middle, the French and the British were negotiating how they should carve up the Ottoman Empire when they lost. So during World War II, the Ottomans were actually on the opposite side of the French and the British. They sided with the Germans and Austria-Hungary with the Central Powers. And as you know, the Central Powers lost in 1918. So when they lost, the winning powers took pieces of it away and decided to redistribute it. Um, if you also recall in history, there was an institution or intergovernmental organization that was sort of the precursor of the United Nations, and that was called the League of Nations. So the League of Nations, um, one of its major goals was this idea of self-determination. Um, it was very popular in the early 1900s, actually, to start to consider getting rid of colonies. One of uh, President Wilson of the United States, uh, one of his big goals was actually self-determination. <clears throat> so what happened was, uh, the League of Nations decided to create a system of mandates in the Middle East um, in order to prepare these former territories of the Ottoman Empire for self-governance. So before, they were all part of one big empire, but now they would be split into chunks. And as you saw in the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which is the map on your right, the French decided to take control of certain areas and the British took these more southern areas, um, including Bahrain, Kuwait, um, some of those sort of island, you know, nation state countries. Um, whereas the French took the areas that would eventually become Syria and Lebanon. Um, so what a mandate is, was basically a, um, a system in which the League of Nations would give these territories to the European powers to govern and prepare the Arabs in these states to be ready for governance. And this was sort of assuming that the Arabs weren't really ready to govern themselves, which is debatable. Um, in, in essence, technically it was different from imperialism and colonialism, but in reality it, it really was practically the same thing. Um, these countries had complete control over these territories. They um, had control over the foreign affairs, they had control over the domestic issues, um, and they played, party, uh, they played politics in these regions. And a lot of what happened as a result, um, well, we'll get into that. <clears throat> So uh, at the same time, there was also the scramble for Africa. So this occurred during the late 1800s or into the early 1900s. And you could see from that very short window, pretty much all of Africa was cut up into these little territories um, that were divided between Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, uh, 
Portugal, Spain, and some of them were actually able to maintain their independence, such as Ethiopia. I think Ethiopia was actually one of very, very few, if not the only, um, territory that was able to maintain independence from European colonialism. Um, and this is important to look at this map of North Africa because a couple of the countries that you're going to be studying in this um, unit uh, are located in North Africa, not just that central part of the Middle East, such as um, Egypt or Tunisia as well. So you can see that Tunisia was ruled by the French, um, Egypt was ruled by the British um, for a certain period of time. Um, so you have to consider how that influence might have played out after their period of colonialism. So you might be wondering, what is the motivation of having um, power over certain territories that are so far away from your home country? Why would Britain, for example, want to control Egypt for a certain period of time? Why would Britain, for example, want to control Bahrain? Or why would France want to control this area that would later become Syria and Lebanon? Um, well, there are two main reasons. The first being territory, and the second being natural resources. So let's break that down. In terms of territory, I have an example for you. So this map on your left shows the Suez Canal. So there's one trade route, this red line, going all the way around the Horn of Africa, and that's for Britain to try to get to India, which was sort of the jewel of its empire. It was its most important imperial holding. Um, and this took a very, a very long time if you went by sea. However, if you took the Suez Canal, you could cut your trip short by around 40%. So this took less time and it made it far easier for Britain to gain access to the trade routes going to India. Um, it was also competing at this time for control um, over Egypt with France. So if, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures of Napoleon with the Sphinx, but uh, during this time period, uh, France actually tried to take over control of Egypt and Britain eventually pushed them out. And so this was just this whole struggle for these trade routes for um, for influence over these territories that were incredibly important. And if you remember what I mentioned, the Middle East had always been an important bridge linking trade, linking these cultural exchanges. So for that reason, the European powers felt that controlling this hub of trade, this hub of transportation would be critical to maintaining their imperial uh, power. Um, so, I mean, you could go through land routes as well, but the Suez Canal is just one example of how um, territory was very important. Another example would be this uh, scenario that occurred during the um, early 20th century called the Great Game. And this was this struggle with, between Russia and Britain over control of Afghanistan. And now technically Afghanistan is part of Central Asia, but some, you know, some places really actually consider it part of the Middle East, uh, including the United States Central Command. Um, so it was, for Russia, a way to gain access to India as well. So during the early 20th century, Russia began encroaching into Afghanistan, and the British, the British saw this as a threat to their imperial holdings in India. So once again, there was this kind of battle over control over a territory that would lead to a more important territory, in, in essence, or a, a really big trade route. So once again, that, that whole idea of the Middle East being a hub of trade, a hub of cultural exchange is very important um, and for strategic value. Another big thing is natural resources. And I'm sure you've heard in the news, um, it's constantly being talked about how the Middle East is very important for oil. Um, maybe not for the United States, but for the rest of pretty well for the rest of maybe the well Europe, Asia. Um, it, it's a very important source of oil. So crude oil was discovered in 1901 um, by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company in Iran, and since then there was this sort of bonanza to try to look for oil in the middle, in the in the Middle East. And the discovery of oil would make the Middle East even more important than just being a hub of trade in later centuries. So we've covered imperialism and its um, short-term impact on the Middle East and what happened in terms of the European powers carving up the Middle East, taking control, and eventually promising to let them have their independence. Um, eventually, they actually did let these countries have their independence. As we can see in this map, um, some of these countries gained independence in the 20s, um, shortly after World War I. Some of them actually gained it after World War II. Actually, the majority of these countries gained it 1946, 1950s, 1960s, some of them even very late into the 1970s. 
as you can see, Bahrain, Qatar, um, Yemen, Oman, were all in, around the late 60s and the 70s. So if you consider it, I mean, these countries only gained independence, you know, 50, 60 years ago. It's, it's still trying to get over the effects of that. And so instead of having the um, European powers control these countries, they eventually had their own nation states. And these nation states were created, though, out of imperial considerations. So what I mean by that is that Syria, Lebanon, um, Palestine, those areas were all carved out because the European powers felt that they wanted to carve it a certain way. They weren't carved out because these ethnic groups wanted to stay um, or wanted them that way. So you'll see how this is a problem in the future. Uh, and another example of how um, these borders were all drawn out of imperial considerations was that look at the size of Saudi Arabia and look at how much oil it has. Now you might think to yourself, why would Britain give Saudi Arabia its own territory if it knew it would have so much oil? But if you see, Saudi Arabia gained its independence in 1932, but it, oil was found there shortly after it gained independence. So in a way, the British made a mistake uh, in terms of their own considerations. Um, so because of this, as I mentioned before, certain ethnic groups were split up. So consider if you and your friends uh, were sitting at a park bench, a very long park bench, you and say 11 of your other friends, and all of a sudden that bench was cut in half and you couldn't talk to your friends anymore, or it was very hard to get over and speak with your friends on the other side. So six of you are grouped together, six of you are groups apart. Now that's a big problem because some people, it's not just their friends, but their families might have been split up or their very close social ties might have been split up. And so examples of this would be um, Iraq or um, an example of another um, problem in terms of uh, grouping would be the Alawites in Syria, which was a different um, problem in terms of these countries grouping enemies together. So let's just say you uh, and your friends were at a picnic table and all of a sudden your worst enemy is sitting there, but then they group you all together in one group and tell you to work together. Um, so you might have some tensions there in terms of trying to form a consensus or do anything else. So here's a case study. You can see in the map on your left, there is a um, red dotted or red um, section that's sort of outlined. And that region is called Kurdistan. But you can see that, or if you have studied a map before, you would know that Kurdistan is not an actual sovereign state. It doesn't have its own region. Um, but this entire region is mostly made up of ethnic Kurds. Um, this region is smack in the middle of Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran. Um, and so these Kurds are generally pretty unhappy at not having their own state, not having their own government, because they're ruled by Turkey in Turkey, they're ruled by the Iranians in Iran, um, and so the Iranian government might not be very nice to them, or the Turkish government might not consider them in terms of their politics because they're a minority group. But if they only have their own state, they would have their own governments, or, or their own uh, governance by Kurdish um, people. So this causes tensions in the Middle East. Um, the Kurds have factions that want to violently separate from these countries. Um, and this, there's always a struggle, this tension. Um, if you also look at the map on your right, you could see the, um, a map of Iraq. And it's divided into the different ethnic and religious groups. And if you remember, the um, US invasion of Iraq in 2003 resulted in this major insurgency and a lot of violence. Well, part of that violence was against US troops. But a major part of that um, violence was actually the Sunnis and the Shias fighting each other in Iraq over control of the political situation. Um, they had militias um, trying to protect their own territories because the government wasn't strong enough. And now, if, if, we look at, if we look at Iraq at this time, which is majority Shia but has a really strong a Sunni minority, and these are different religious groups, um, there is a lot of political tension and there's still violence in Iraq. Um, so this was a major problem, and it's, to a degree, it, it stems all the way back to how Iraq was drawn up as a British territory. Now, this other example in this next slide is the Shia-Sunni split. And if you remember, uh, we just talked about it, but then the Shia and the Sunni are these different religious groups. So this map of the Middle East shows how um, these 
different religious groups were sort of spread out over the Middle East and how these borders sometimes cut into um, areas. So, you know, once again, you could see Iraq has this big um, Shia population, but it also has a lot of Sunni controlled areas. Afghanistan has Shia and Sunni, um, Iran as well. So these borders weren't really very helpful to reducing religious tension uh, and not just political or ethnic tension. Um, and so when these Arab nation states eventually gained independence, they originally had a lot of optimism. They had hope that they could finally rule themselves uh, independently and not under the auspices of European control. Um, but unfortunately, political development was immediately hampered. And a lot of this was because of the sort of after effects of European imperialism. So first of all, there was too much power in the executive branch of the government. Um, the executive in the United States is the presidency, for example. Um, this is sort of the, the branch that uh, tries to control the, well, it's, it's sort of the bureaucracy and the head of the state. And so there's too much power in the head of the state. Uh, and, a, and part of this is because the colonial powers supported a sort of autocratic leadership when they originally had control over these territories. They would set up a local government that had a very, very strong head so that they wouldn't have to deal with all these little minority groups. They could just deal with that very strong head. It'd be easier to sort of uh, delegate. So for example, if you were a European power and there were 30 students in the classroom and you had to talk to the students, would it be easier to talk to all 30 or just to talk to one student who you put in charge and give all the power to? So once you do that uh, and then you leave, there's, um, there's a sort of pattern of, of strong leadership at the very top levels of the government and very weak sort of resistance because it's already been set up for so long like that. Um, there's also religious um, and ethnic tensions. As, I, as we talked about before, the example of the Sunnis and the Shia, um, the Kurds and the Arabs, um, there's a sort of um, tension between these different religious groups that was actually made worse by the colonial powers who wanted to sort of divide and rule. So instead of having all these um, ethnic groups and religious groups come together to, to fight the European powers, um, the European powers divided them up and tried to play up their differences so that they would be squabbling amongst themselves instead of focusing on the foreigners. Um, and after they left, this, um, this tension remained. And it's, it remains to this day to an extent. And this is not only because of the European powers, but the European powers actually played it up to an extent. Um, and third, there was a really strong male-dominated culture. Um, a lot of the Middle East at that time was sort of ruled by these tribes, and they had strong tribal allegiances. And most of these tribes were led by strong male rulers. And so afterward, when there's a nation state, um, a lot of the people are already used to having a strong male ruler. So this sort of leads to autocracy very slowly. Um, and there's also perhaps, I mean, very importantly, there was, a, there was an absence of a strong civil society. Things like NGO and um, civilian participation in politics, um, there, there wasn't really a, a check on the executive branch of the government. So, Instead of having um, different interest groups try to make sure that their um, interests are served, the, the civil society was so weak that, these, that the executive branch sort of just consolidated its power and no one really cared too much. And no one, you know, everyone just sort of looked away until it was too late and all of a sudden you have an autocracy. And so we'll talk about autocracies now. An, an autocracy is a form of government in which all of the power um, of the state is centralized into one person or just one very, very small group. Um, this is very different from our system, which is a democracy where we elect our leaders and they represent us. Well, we're, we have a democratic republic. Um, they serve our interests and there's a lot of sort of separation of powers, you know, into different branches of government, into different people, there's a lot of voting. Well, instead an autocracy is just one person dictates what everyone does. That one person stays in power for years and years and years. Um, in some cases, up to 40 years. And if you consider that, that's probably older than maybe even some of your parents or probably older than your teacher. Um, and they often outlaw opposition political parties. So there's a very strong control over the state, over the military, over the police force, and they crack down on anyone who tries to say anything against their word. 
And so they just consolidate their power over time and just stay in power. Um, and this is very problematic because the people usually aren't being represented. <clears throat> and so there are um, three countries that you'll be studying in more detail in this unit. Um, those three countries are Egypt, Tunisia, and Syria, as you may already know. Um, as you can see in this example, or in these pictures, Mubarak was the ruler of Egypt all the way from 1981 until the Arab Spring. And that's a very long period of time, around 30 years. Um, ben Ali entered office in 1987. Um, you could see Assad entered office in 2000, Assad is Syria. Um, but his father was actually in control for long before he was in office as well. So all of these leaders have been in power for decades, and even before then, their predecessors were in power for several decades as well. So there's this pattern of this very strong, um, long-lasting autocratic leadership where they have complete control over their societies. But all of a sudden, this starts changing, and this is what our unit is about. And you'll learn about that soon. But just to summarize, if you can't remember all the key facts in this, um, well, I'll break it all down. I'll break it down to the most important ones. First of all, the thing to remember is that the Middle East is and has always been a vital crossroads for trade between Europe and Asia and Africa. Um, trade and ideas, and it's just a, an important hub. Um, and to an, to an extent now, it's also natural resources. Um, the second is that European colonialism has, long, has left these very long-lasting impacts on the region. And we talked about it before. We talked about how the European powers played up these ethnic rivalries, how they cut up these territories into these regions that were completely drawn out of their own considerations, not the considerations of the people, um, and how the way they ruled these regions eventually led to these autocratic governments, um, well, helped lead to these autocratic governments. Third, that autocratic leaders rose to power due to many, many factors. Um, just talked about the European powers um, you know, giving these leaders power, but there's also cultural factors, um, you know, social factors, um, historical reasons, and those are very important to consider when you're thinking about the rest of this unit and the um, modern history of Egypt, Tunisia, and Syria, the three countries that you'll be covering in more detail in this unit. Um, so, that concludes the presentation. If you have any questions, make sure to ask your site supervisors and interns and your teacher especially. Um, I know this presentation had a lot of material to cover and it had a lot of history, but just remember, the dates aren't very important. It's just important to remember the context of what was going on. Um, it's important to know how the past connects to the present and how even though you know, things have, it's been you know, maybe up to 100 years or 80 years or 50 years since European powers left, they still have very long lasting impacts. And this geopolitical struggle over the Middle East um, that was occurring all the way back then has really, um, you know, is, is part of what we have to consider when we're thinking about it today. Um, thank you very much um, and thank you for your time.